There we go. Broadcast is live. Got to turn it down a little bit, though, so we don't get like this echo thing going right here. Because there's a lot of things to cover. And uh, yes, I'm definitely going to have a drink for this one because I was sitting here and doing my thing, testing servers, and I don't usually play video games. I was thinking maybe I should play video games. I said, nah, I'll test some servers. And of course, while you're testing servers and running benchmarks, you go through and read the news and the latest Twitter. And occasionally it, it makes you go, what? <laughs> what happened? What is what is this thing going on right now? No, there, there's not a file called and. I, let me pull the name up exactly so we can read it together because let's make sure this works. There we go. Cam and desktop. Um, yeah. So uh, right here, we're going to go down to what made me just kind of cringe a little bit was the file. I should have had this pulled up. I, this is very impromptu, but I figured all of you want to join in and read the news with me about this. Um Oh, essentially what they found was a, why this, I do not like the way TechCrunch has this weird, come on, back, there we go, there we go. So, public screenshot between Okta's internal apps and systems really admitted, blah, blah, blah. This is where things get a little bit crazy because they basically had dumped, right here, domain admins, domain admins dash lastpass.xls. Really? That's a great file name. I would have thought this to be, oh, I don't know, like a some type of ransomware canary to detect someone in your network. But no, 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 this, this is not. This is not that. This is um, what they had found. Actually, let me split the screens a little bit differently here for uh, people. But I'm just scratching my head over all this. It is, um, but I figured I, I have a lot to say, but let me get my um, screen sharing set up. One day. Soon, Tom will have uh, an entire team of people that does this. I don't know when that day is. <laughs> if anyone's looking to be like the heart person to help me do this, I don't know what that title is. Media co-producer. <laughs> so good evening. I see we have a few people in there. But, you know, domain admins lastpass.xls doesn't seem like something you want, you know, on the screen right there. Uh, it would be that way from, I think, where do you see it? Um, but let's break down kind of all the things that happened and the things that led up to this event, because this is not the only event. This is, we'll, we'll re rewind a little bit, just a little bit here and, uh, share this tab because yes, they made some arrests. Um, well, they did leak some source code. Now, this is just me being smart, you know, kind of a smart aleck here. Lapsus hackers leaked 37 gig of Microsoft alleged source code. It was Bing. They leaked Bing. It's it's not, I don't really think a lot of people care about leaking Bing. It's definitely proof you were there. You you captured the attention of people because you were inside of there, but it was Bing. That's part of the problem. Um, then this, uh, here we go, is the arrests. And seven suspected members of Lapsus Hacker Gang arrested ages 16 to 21. Now, let's break down a couple of the other just kind of broader topics regarding this. And essentially, you have the Lapsus group. And they have been getting more and more brazen, really uh, diving into this whole hacking thing. And, you know, I, I will admit to having partaked and shared in the memes because we didn't know a lot about Lapsus. We know they were in some big companies. They got into the biggest names. And of course, discovering that they were a bunch of younger kids is one of those wow moments where you go, you know, it's the billion dollar company, you know, Okta, Microsoft, and a list of others, you know, these not just average companies, not big companies, but the biggest companies that they've gotten into. And this is really interesting from that standpoint, because you have especially after the arrest, what turns out to be some teenagers. So you have a billion dollars of cybersecurity cumulatively spread across these companies. Probably who knows exactly how much they spend, but they're big. They have big budgets. They have big teams of security people. And these teenagers got in and made a mess of things. But there's a few things that were underestimated. And this is the part that 
takes them from being the hackers of mischievous kids to uh, going beyond what security people expected them to be. And this is kind of where that mistake has been made. Um, it is, <laughs> I like, so what someone said there, be selective. Don't get a mediocre media co-producer. You're right. That's why I am selective. And that's why I keep doing things myself. Um, nonetheless. So the whole problem really comes down to, and I'm going to hold up my little security keys. Like I have right here. We got myself, um, my, uh, UV key one set up as with FIDO auth. And here is a, uh, trust key also has FIDO auth. If you haven't seen them, they look just about the same as a YubiKey. It's a touch one. I'm doing videos on these coming soon. And this is even something Microsoft in their debrief mentions is the use of these keys being probably where they have to go going forward. And the underestimation of the adversary is where the threat modeling was not done right. They decided that we're going to use a phone. So phones are backups. This is the thing. We're going to text message a phone as a backup for people's security. And this, to me, is an underestimation of their adversary. Your Microsoft, your Okta, your very large companies, and having phones as a backup is really probably not the best idea because the adversary was willing to go further than you expected. And what I mean by that is they were willing to, and Krebs on security points this out, and I think he did probably the best on it. And when you go down here, and uh, we'll go to share this tab. And add the stream. So Krebs dives into this topic and they talk about just how much they're willing to offer. And let me scroll in and make this plenty big enough for everyone to read. Offering employees at AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon up to $20,000 a week to perform inside jobs. This is the underestimating of the adversary. When you have an adversary that's willing to pay employees, not one person. They don't got one $20,000. Like, no, no, we're going to put you on the payroll for $20,000 a week. Who? All of you that say yes, essentially. The kind of money they're playing with allowed them to buy insider access at a pretty unprecedented level. So it's not just some hacking skills that they had. It's a little bit more than that. It's the fact that they had the means, the monetary means especially, to gain a level of insider access that you wouldn't normally put on your risk tolerance. Like, oh, yeah, it's really hard to SIM swap a phone. We we know, generally speaking, there's a simplicity level to it. But also, it, it takes a person who is willing to spend that kind of money. Now, if you're an average person, are they going to go after you? Well, how much money do you have? What is the value? Are they willing to spend $20,000 to get into your email um, and you know bypass your 2FA and hack your phone for someone who doesn't have a lot of money? Probably not. There's not a good return on investment unless they're just after the person. Um, but when you go in and you have an adversary that's willing to spend that kind of money, and of course, they are because your company's the size of Microsoft and Okta. And there's been plenty of others that these people have been involved in. So it is really, really tough to threat model against that because there's always people wanting to push these, you know, little security keys and saying, hey, this is probably a better way to do it if we use these little uh, hardware tokens. But then there's someone else pushing back because we, the IT people who implement security, we're the enemies of convenience, according to the end users that have to deal with the policies we set forth. And they're not wrong. We, we are trying to make it inconvenient, but not for you, the end user, but for the external threats that want to take over. And this is where there's such a, um, you know, rethinking going to probably happen. And I think this is probably what's going to come out of a lot of this is this is big enough news that they're going to go, all right, if these kids can do it, how many other people did it maybe for an espionage? And the espionage is much scarier because they go in and they're silent. They're just there to take data. That's it. So they generally will go from a much quieter standpoint. Um, the lapsus group, they're there to make noise and, well, extort money. And they have their own uh, ends that they're trying to do on this. So, yes. And it, you're not wrong. This is so much... <laughs> So like Veronica says here, it's way above script, kitties. You are not wrong at all. And 
Cody here says, Sim swapping can make a lot of people money. Just listen to Dark Knight Diaries episode about it. Specifically, the Dark Knight Diaries episode about it is called Dirty Comms. And in the Dirty Comms episode, Jack Resider dives into, and I should probably leave this in the links as well, is uh, Dark Knight Diaries, Dirty Comms. We'll pull this up and throw a link in here. This is... Uh, Great episode and dives into exactly this, the sim swapping, what they're willing to do. And this is including, and I'm not going to spoil it too much for you, but uh, the sim swapping includes smash and grabbing. So they have people who literally run in and grab the tablet that can do this from a uh, cell phone store. And that's included in this Darknet Diaries episode. You know, it's episode 112, Dirty Comms. Highly recommend listening to it. It's not specifically about lapsus. It's about thinking about the threat model as it applies to the way lapsus performed this. And that's where it becomes so, you know, absolutely kind of scary. And it's always, you know, if you if you really dive into and have had teams, uh, red teamers that I've met and talks I've gone to, um, and any red teamer, it's always a joke like me and Xavier, um, my friend who's uh, hands of the enterprise offensive security, his company where he does red teaming, he does offensive security testing. And he kind of jokes, you know, Hey, red teams always win. And it's at what cost? And this is where scope comes in of what are you trying to protect against? You know, one of the really interesting talks I went to was someone who was military in their background. So they're not just a pen tester, but someone who, uh, had been involved in the military uh, and high levels of pen testing. Matter of fact, their crazy pen, pen testing stories were done overseas, specifically in even some of the war zone areas. And it's a question of how far you'll take it and what you're mitigating against. Obviously, if you're talking about a wartime or military, the stakes are high. Therefore, the security that comes with it is very high. But go back to domestic here and talking about businesses, this is a lot to think about from that standpoint in understanding your adversary and what they are doing. And this is where the adversary, the lapsus group in this particular case, but they were underestimated. They didn't think they would go that far, but they did. And of course, the shenanigans that we'll get to in a moment here is where the bigger part is. Um, let's see what I'll read some of the comments here. So. Uh, team of T-Mobile employees about 20 years ago to do something similar. I'm wondering if it's different. Yeah, they've, there's a lot of, we just don't have all the details yet. That's going to start coming out. And uh, it's just, it's kind of a mess. Now, the other part is um, now that we've kind of talked about the adversary, talked about the underestimating of the adversary and how they did this, let's talk a little bit about the, details that came up. This is the more Octa stuff that we'll dive into. Now, we're going to take this with a bit of, um, where is the one I'm looking for? This one right here. We're going to share this tab, throw it back up on the screen here. So this is something, and this is from Twitter. I was tweeting this uh, as well. And this is the one that really got me. Now, this part's very, very new. So I don't know a lot of the details of this particular part. And let me explain. This is just tweeted, and I'm always a little skeptical when you see um, someone tweeting out something that maybe they shouldn't have. You know, an independent security researcher has posted a purported detailed timeline for the lapsus breach of a third-party Okta provider in January. Now, I don't know exactly, but... Bill has his name here, and Bill is standing by that this new documents, and he covers this. And this is where we learn some more details of what's going on. Now, Okta has made one misstep after another on this because we weren't breached. Nothing to see here. Nothing going on. You know, the usual um, terrible PR. There, nothing, nothing like Microsoft. And, you know, if we look at what Microsoft did, um, they, did they said, we got owned, and here's what happened. Matter of fact, this is um, Microsoft was very clear. And this is where you say it, it's not that this gives us sympathy for Microsoft, but we appreciate the honesty paying employees to targeted organizations, suppliers, and business partners for access and credentials to MFA. Microsoft came clean. That's how this happened. They were veering, you know, 
right straightforward is is you know straight up this is what happened here and they even post one of the things of hey, we recruit employees and insiders and microsoft saying hey this is a really hard threat to uh fight against because well as i said it was kind of uh, underestimating but where this gets a little bit more confusing over here though is the whole timeline of what's going on over here with them with okta it's like the more we learn about Octo, the more like, guys, you, you, you're you gaining news by trying to stay out of it, by trying to tell us there was nothing there. Every news story becomes a bigger news story of another lie that Octo was caught in. And that's where I am just like, they're detailing it all out. And this is all on Twitter. This is all linked, by the way. This is in the description. I put all these articles with the exception of Dark Knight Diaries I'll add later are currently in the description of this video if you want to read deeper on any of them. But yeah, just, I don't, I just can't believe um, their their willingness to keep going beyond and diving into this. And of course, there's, I'll, I'll actually jump to uh, the Twitter itself here so we can see the document a little better. Um, they're breaking down some of this. Now, one of the other things that was in here that was interesting too you know, like I said, all the documents, everything, they're all directly on Twitter. Um, but the other piece that was in here that I found interesting was, uh, where is the, do, 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 right here we go. This is, this is where I just said, all right, I got to drink and turn this into there. All right. Lapses did not uh, begin investigating the compromise system until January 19th. Um, timely posted. On that day, Threat Actor did a Bing shirt. For privilege escalations and with little regards for OPSEC. They were logged in searching on Bing. They, the irony of that is funny. Like they're they're on, I guess Bing probably searches GitHub pretty well. You know, Microsoft owns GitHub. I don't know. And <laughs> this is, they're searching for things like, hey, how do we uh, do bypass on this? And then, you know, FireEye. How'd they bypass the security on this thing? How do you get something like Mimikatz running if you have endpoint security on there? Bypass the FireEye endpoint engine by terminating it. Oh, good. That wasn't protected because they there. And then they simply downloaded the official version of Mimikatz, a popular credential, a popular credential dumping utility uh, from its repository. Mm, yeah, that's not good. And then they, now this is common. I, we even see this even in a small attacks so when we've uh, gone through stuff. This is really common. The attacker created a backdoor with the user's within Sitel's environment and finished off their attack by creating a malicious email transport rule to forward all mail within their environment to their own accounts. This is actually a pretty common tactic. Um, they they will set up the email. And if you're not familiar with how Office 365 and the boxes are set up, if you don't know what to look for, um, this is something you should be triggering on if you're in security, like triggering on a change, because when that change happens, something happened. Matter of fact, this is when you take over an organization, one of the challenges is making sure that you've looked for this and the organization you're taking over doesn't already have this in place because this is often a frequent, when they get in, this is a step they take before they finish off the attack. Um, that is, that is uh, just a big piece of it. The other thing that was really annoying about just the methodology that Okta, especially their first post on this was about was Octa's not didn't just downplay it. They also said something that was the best double speak ever that I actually kind of laughed. It, it, it's not, I don't think everyone really caught the nuance of what they said. They said they didn't have any more privilege than the engineering laptop. Oh yeah. They didn't have any more privilege than the engineering laptop. What privilege does an engineering laptop have? You seem to have overlooked this little detail. Like we don't know how much privilege an engineering laptop has. But I mean, it seems quite dismissive. It's only an engineering laptop. So that the whole breach thing and everything else is kind of a mess. Now, let's take some questions here and there. Um, did they publish private keys for a customer's SSO? Not that I am aware of. Uh, basically, the engineering, as we have somehow come to understand without the best clarity from Okta, the uh, ability they had would have been to reset passwords and reset MFA. Now, they downplayed that, but 
if you put together like the Krebs and the Microsoft report talking about Okta and their involvement in SIM swapping and buying employees at major telcos, that's all they needed. If they have access to an engineering level uh, system at Okta that allows for password reset and they're able to control the phones of the people that they're after, well, those are the two pieces of things you need to get where you want to be. They're going to use this engineering level to issue a password, and Okta's thinking, hey, no sweat, no problem. It's just going to prompt that user for on their phone, except for it's not their phone anymore. When they get SIM swapped, it belongs to the threat actor. So now the Okta has the ability to finish off the attack and get where they want to be. Um, so that I know of, they didn't do any SSO stealing. Um, I don't know of any compromises related to that, but it all seems more related to the fact that they it, using a phone as a backup. Uh, these zero-day security vendors need to explain why they keep missing anomalous behaviors associated with the hacks. Well, this is a, a big piece of it. Um, it's... They had a lot of tools. They obviously were aware of the breach. They just downplayed it and didn't take action. Uh, a lot of their failure wasn't in not knowing as much as it was in not doing. So having the knowledge that an event occurred and taking action on said event and the proper action and reporting is uh, where a big failure on Octus part was and why there's so much more in the news now than they were before. Short and quick, do we need to stop using Okta for the time being? Honestly, I think Okta, once you have companies like Mandian involved, they're going to go through a better security audit. There's also no easy way to just stop using Okta. Um, Okta is not like the biggest security vendor and there's like someone right behind them. Okta is absolutely massive. And for some organizations, it's not an easy thing to say, oh, we're going to stop using Okta because there's not a drop in replacement. Uh, I, there's a lot of people I know and they have all of their authentication across a thousand, 2000 users and deep integrations into their platforms, all with Okta. That's not something we can just flip a switch and turn off and switch to someone else. It, conceptually, yeah, it's just a drop in. We're going to use a different SSO vendor. Reality is getting someone set up with another SSO vendor when they have a thousand users or 2000 or 10,000 users is no small task because these integrations are not simple to get deployed and they're not simple to unwind and switch to a different version of authentication. So um, I think they've contacted all the people involved. They said at first, nobody was affected. Last I heard from Okta was 2.5% of their customers affected. So there was a very specific target group of customers. So they know they had proper logging to know what happened. So those customers have been contacted. By the way, all this Okta uh, breach stuff was done and closed in five days in January. So it didn't persist on. Um, so that's a, yeah. I, I don't necessarily say stop using Okta. Um, do you want to look for an alternative as a project? Sure. It's just not practical to say just stop using it. It's fun explaining to CEOs why they can't just auto forward all their work email for their personal emails anymore. Yeah, it is. It is fun explaining it to them. That is for sure. Uh, is there anything that a next generation firewall would have prevented? No, no, they were using standard levels of access. Uh, there's nothing that a next gen firewall, this is not something they were. Yeah, this is not really at the firewall level. This is all at the sign on level. Uh, let's see. It's time to go back 30 years and do things the old way. It worked and we didn't have issues. Well, I'm sorry, but that isn't how things work. Um, that's not how we're going. And the uh, good old days are a myth. This is as simple as that. We, uh, we are all easily deceived by the charitable gifts of nostalgia. It's just the way our brain works. The uh, nostalgia brings you back to only the good times. It's a function of human memory. The reality is... Things were very difficult then. Things were getting hacked then. It was just a really small thing because there was no money in it. Um, you can't just rewind and go back. Um, that's not the solution either. Uh, what's amazing to me is companies keep making the same mistake even after seeing the results with other companies doing the exact same thing. That is a real puzzle. And I think it's the myth 
that just because a company reaches a $26 billion market cap, they are somehow different than me or you, just because of their scale and scope, that the human beings in charge are somehow different, somehow better advised. And what you learn as you climb the ladder of success and you create different circles of, you know, maybe friends that you have that work at these large companies, you realize they still do some of the same dumb things they did when you knew them 20 years ago, <laughs> despite the bigger payroll. They're generally more rounded and more educated, but there's still occasional human nature things that come into play. And they are not immune from going, it didn't happen because my reputation matters. <laughs> I always wonder, uh, wondered how eSIM would change uh, sim swapping, good or bad. It's all Sim swapping is a real problem. It really comes down to the phone is not the ideal place for this. Uh, turning off support access unless you need to have them have access when possible. Yeah, that probably makes sense there. Secure Onyx would have detected the anomaly. I don't know. Um, I don't really think that they didn't. It's not a not knowing thing is a problem. They knew. Matter of fact, the indicators are all there. It's their failure to take action on them. Um, that one right there, where you said, uh, this is the exact phrase that probably is really good. There were certainly a number of indicators of compromise. They should have been paying attention. Yes, that's the real problem. Their failure to take action on the things they had. When you have the intel and you don't take deep action on it, um, it is just where a lot of the problem is. The other thing there is there's there's obviously there's undoubtedly in these large organizations a bunch of people dangling these little security keys around going, hey, you know what FIDO would have solved? This problem. You know, there's someone pushing for this right now. And there was someone pushing for it before, but someone said they're not going to go and take over cell phones. They're not going to pay off uh people who work at these phone companies. Not going to happen. And the reality is it did happen. So this is where things got a lot about, you know, I, we're going to start seeing slowly and oddly what's driving the small business market for, uh, in my opinion, the big driver right now in a small business market when it comes to changes in security has everything to do with the insurance companies requiring it. Like MFA is not an option. You can't get insurance without it and you need insurance. So it's not like there's some policy or some, guy with random live streams on Monday night saying, use more security, changing the buying to small business owners. Matter of fact, the majority of my audience are probably more like me, work in a level of sysadmin where we are the ones pounding our little security keys and yelling, why aren't you using this little cool device? Because Fido is great. Fido is much, much harder to get a hold of. I mean, you could say, well, now they got to come and take it from you, but that's a little bit harder to do. That's a, another level. I'm just not saying you can't come take my FIDO key and then acquire my passwords and then get in. I'm just saying that raises the bar a little bit higher to do something like that. Also, I have these different FIDO keys, as I mentioned earlier, because I'm doing some videos talking about FIDO. I was working on them before Okta, um, and I got sidetracked with a few other things, and this seems really relevant for, for me to rant about very soon. <laughs> uh, Fido is your friend. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, I know. And Travis is in the same, the um, Travis is among the IT people that <laughs> we, we know. We're always trying to get people to be more secure. And things like that. It is very, very tricky. Ranting on. Yes, a little bit. Ranting on, having a drink. Just wanted to share all this with all of you. I, did, I There's no time limit I specifically set on this other than it won't be all night. I just wanted to get a few of these things on here. I didn't feel like taking the time to really compose a video. <laughs> so I just said, live stream, rant about what I've been reading because it was aggravating me. <laughs> well, no, what was actually aggravating me was I was setting up a server and... Um, I'm sorting out a problem with a ZFS on it that I created on the lab. So I'm going, I'm sorting out a lab idea I had and trying to make it work properly. So that was annoying me. And then the news hit me like, all right, let's, let's rant. <laughs> the problem with large companies and logs, a huge amount of information being generated and having a clean process 
uh, is key in achieving. Yes, but it's completely possible. My friend, um, I've mentioned a couple of times before, one of my friends works for a very large company. He manages 178,000 endpoints as the head of the SOC. They have really good filtering systems and they do full logging and full packet capture of everything. They know what went where when, and they know that for quite a bit of time going backwards. So it's not that it can't be done. And it's a company you've never heard of. They, they have managed to stay out of the news because they spend uh, a lot of time engineering things properly to not be in there. You can filter logs. You can parse logs. You can look for very specific things, and then you set triggers on those specific things. That's the important part. The cell phones, especially SMS, SMS is very insecure. They shouldn't ever be using securing critical systems. I agree with that. Um, I it took I it was took forever for some of these companies to stop using my phone as the backup. It was annoying. It was why do they do it this way? And uh, you know, I, I don't know, but I feel and I'm not this is not a challenge by any means by which people should test this. I feel when people say, Hey, uh, who do you use for cell phone service? And I'm like, Well, I use Google Fi. And that is uh because I believe Google does a little bit better a job than maybe AT&T and T-Mobile and Verizon at protecting numbers. I don't know that to be absolutely true, but I do feel that they are the best. My bigger goal is always, always to just not have my cell phone be the second factor of authentication. Any number that can be ported, any number that can be SIM swapped just seems like a bad idea because you're at that mercy. Uh, TOTP authentication is good. FIDO authentication, as I bring up with these keys right here, I think is good. The authentication methods uh, that were used in, obviously, in these recent breaches proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that at these large companies, they're going to just have to stop relying on this because you can't expect AT&T to get better or Verizon to get better. I don't think that will ever happen. That is That is not what I would bank my security on. <laughs> The, uh, so glad I got my Yubico key. Yeah, I also want to bring up, it's not just Yubico. Fido Alliance keys, such as this trust key, is a uh, good choice. This is not a Yubi key, but it is the same thing. It is good Fido hardware token. Uh, what's in the glass? We'll talk about that in a minute. No pizza tonight. No pizza tonight. Nope. Can't wait to see your next FIDO video. Yes, I did a FIDO video regarding FIDO with uh, SSH. I'll be covering FIDO with Jack Daniels. And uh, put a little in there. For those wondering what's in the glass. <laughs> the only thing, this is this is your, um, this is, I should just put on here, in case of another breach emergency, just grab this. No. <laughs> Cybersecurity backup plan. <laughs> You keep switching 2FA bank accounts until you find that you keep switching bank accounts until you find a company that actually um, allows for something other than stupid cell phones. Yeah. Um, I try not to use text two factor. I like a good authenticator. Is that something you advise over us? Yes. TOTP authentication is great. Uh, didn't RSS get hacked and associated with the tokens leaked? Uh, RSS, I'm not clear what you're asking. I've not tested the Nitro key. Um, the Trust key is part of the FIDO Alliance, and I tried this. I don't know if the Trust key, the I mean, the Nitro key has gone through verification. I haven't looked up. I've been, I've been looking these up, and I ordered this one because it was cheap on Amazon. Um, as long as they're part of the FIDO Trust Alliance, they should be good. And they, these keys and YubiKey being the leader in this market, um, they go through their own testing, just like anything else. They validate that these keys have been properly vetted to make sure that they do the thing they say they're going to do. And there's not some attack on these keys that would somehow unwind them or compromise them in a way that would, well, allow them to be not good. <laughs> Not a jump server, it's a drunk server. Eh, maybe. <laughs> I don't drink that much. Uh, black hat bottle, yes. Cybersecurity backup plan is uh, back up your resume. 
RSA tokens. What RSA tokens were compromised? That I'm unclear on what you're asking still. Um, didn't Google roll out 80K YubiKeys before uh, making their own Titan key? Yeah, I'm fuzzy on, I, I have a feeling there's a business deal um, that we're unclear on that why they started with YubiKey and switched to Titan. Obviously, besides being their own key, um, and I, it's not a cost thing with Google. I don't, I really don't picture it going, hey, we can't make the deal we want. There's probably something more to it that we don't understand um, about the deal that was made, but why they switched to Titan key. But yeah. So I spent the last 16 years working uh, working with and not for AT&T. They are indeed a mess. Yes. Um, it Look, the, the, it's all they're good at, like you said, is being a dumb pipe. We, we have certainly had our own interactions with them that have been uh, less than less than wonderful, we'll just say. As a matter of fact, um, I believe I uh, met, I think we've met in person, uh, M-O-E-L-M-O-E-L-A-S-U-S. -E -E I think we've met in person, haven't we? I don't know. I'm curious. So I think I know who you are, <laughs> which is funny, especially when you said you've been working with at and uh, I think we had drinks together a long time ago. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, the worst thing about my YubiKey is if a key gets lost, I have to remember everywhere that I use that particular key. This is a challenge, but not an insurmountable one. And one of the th reasons I have two keys. Uh, when you're setting up keys, you set both of them up. So the FIDO spec does not require multiple FIDO slots, but it's encouraged. And Bitwarden's an easy example. So when I log into Bitwarden, there's, I think you can have up to six FIDO slots. So you just have to painstakingly register two keys for each system that you do. Or some, some systems have TOTP or FIDO, uh, and they allow you to choose which one you want so you can have both registered at the same time. So having the FIDO for your convenience and security, but then having TOTP as a backup, there's an option as well. YubiKey or FIDO, been looking to use, but haven't got there. I like the FIDO implementation better. I like the way the FIDO system works really well. I, it's taken a lot of time for me to get a deeper understanding of it. I'm making sure I, I've been reading through a lot of like all the technical specs of exactly how FIDO auth works, all the details, because that's how I make my videos. I, I spend a lot of time reading on some of these authentication methods, make sure I understand them so I can explain them in the most concise way possible. And of course, accurate way possible matters a lot. And uh, yeah, FIDO, I like, well, one, because you can use more than just YubiKey, and it's just a well-thought-out protocol. Um, it's got a lot of good support. Yep, okay. I know exactly who you are. <laughs> we, yes, at Ignite a couple of years back. Cheers. <laughs> It's the, it, it, when you said the AT&T thing, I'm like, oh, I remember our talks. <laughs> and and uh, yes, for sure. I should, if we, if, I don't know, sometime we should, uh, in our travels, maybe we'll connect again. But in the meantime, it's nice to see you online. <laughs> uh, so I accidentally wiped my uh, TOTP from a YubiKey. It was a pain fixing that smooth move. I don't put my TOTP on my YubiKey. Um, I've talked about this before. I use an application called Aegis. Um, Aegis works really well. I don't know. I could probably filter it. I have a demo one in here, but nope. Or no. Oh, there we go. I've no, I, I already forgot what this server is. Um, Aegis works really well for uh, TOTP. So I have this demo server. You can see the numbers rolling on here. Aegis by default. When you open it, let me uh, close it. If we go back over here, it won't even unlock without um, a password to unlock the vault. That's an important aspect of the way it works. So it's not like someone could even just take the phone. They, you know, have to 
unlock the vault and get in. It's an extra step of protection. I've encrypted the vault on here. I don't have it backing up. I manually back it up when I add TOTP keys. I don't add them that often. So those are just those extra steps you take to... Um, it's inconvenient, I, I won't lie, but it also helps you sleep at night. It, it helps you uh, not constantly worry that that aspect is covered. There's always going to be some other aspect. There's going to be a firewall rule. You forgot a thing you opened up. There's lots of risks you take, um, but at least I've put a password on this. If someone wanders off with my phone, you know, if first you got the password to my phone, then second, you need the password, which is not the same, of course, um, to the application on there. So... Hmm. Ah. Any tips for getting switched to the app base versus codes using SMS? Uh, explain as concisely as you can how these companies get hacked. The problem is the counter you frequently will run into, the, the objection is going to be, oh, I'm not Microsoft. I'm not as big as Opta. I'm not a $26 billion a year company. They're not going to target me. The reality is the small businesses are low hanging fruit and are targeted probably statistic. I mean, just because there's more of them, there's more targets. So they are hit all the time. You just don't hear about it. And because it's not newsworthy, if a small company with 10 employees loses $20,000 to some scam or some hack that, you know, was able to get into their systems and do a wire transfer, it's not going to make the news. Local company loses 20 grand. Nobody, nobody really writes the articles for that. And by the way, it's not usually reported because the last thing that company wants to do is talk about losing 20 grand. Um, they're not, they, they may have to report to authorities. They may have to, re if, if they're in a regulated industry and maybe in the future, because it seems like a lot more companies fall under this regulated industry policy that's going to be passed. So it's hard to convince people, but it does happen. It's just a, it's a hard sell. Uh, yes, looks about, and that is the thing here. Uh, when you're looking at like the trust key, the trust key is a lot less expensive, but feels well built. I don't see, uh, come on, focus. There we go. It's, um, very much, very close in size to the Yubi key, but not really, uh, that much different from it. So, Yeah, the I, I like it. Um, I so far I haven't found I don't know a flaw with it. In more and more things are supporting Fido, so these seem pretty good. Matter of fact, it's a good excuse to buy two of them because you can buy two of them for what you can buy for one of these um, keys right here. So. <laughs> hey, no problem. I'm glad I was able to help on that. So, and I have more Yubi keys. They're in a drawer over here. Where'd they go? Maybe they're in this drawer. Ah, yeah, more of them. Because uh, I get all these for my staff, too. So I got these for my staff. I got a few for me. I program them. I rewrote this one. I was changing how the key works. I, I want to do a deep dive into uh, some of the weird things about the way these uh, keys. They're great. Nothing bad in terms of when I say weird, just understanding the technology, not so much. Um, uh, anything else like not not anything that I know of any security problems with. Speaking of that, that's a good question. How do you know Fido Key doesn't have a back door? Um, that's where they are vetted by the Fido Alliance, and the design has been thoroughly looked through that these themselves are not a back door. These are not emulating a keyboard, and you kind of know that when you plug it in. You know if it's going to emulate a device beyond what its capabilities are supposed to be. There's an indicator. Um, but other than that, the FIDO backdoors would be really hard because of the way you authenticate things with FIDO. This is why FIDO is such a good protocol is the level of back and forth that has to go through in order to sign something essentially and, and it do the exchange of security information. So yes, it's, um, it, it, it's going to be part of what I have to explain. You can go over and understand what the FIDO Alliance means. I think it says in the back of this that this is a FIDO Alliance key. I think it's right on the back. They go through they go through testing. So it's a valid question. It's also why I wouldn't buy one that hasn't gone through um, the testing of the FIDO Alliance. I think that's, I don't know if I can even get it to display. 
somewhere on the back of here, you can kind of read it. It says, oops. <laughs> Try to make the camera focus, right? Why don't we go to the website? Because that's probably easier than messing with a camera. I mean, we could always, we could keep messing with the camera, but we'll type in trust key. And uh, pull this up. These are good questions. I mean, absolutely. Don't uh, don't take don't trust it because some guy drinking whiskey on YouTube said to trust it. That's definitely not good advice. Um, Fido Level Two Certified. Uh, well, they have. We don't want the fingerprint one. This is the one I have right here. Is the uh, T one twenty? I'm sorry, T one ten because it doesn't have the USB C. These are. Inexpensive, FIDO U2 and OTP sort, FIDO2 certified. Um, you can look up the FIDO2 certified process, and that's how you can go through the testing on there. What's more fun is to look up how if we find where's the, there we go. Where is a good, okay, find. Uh, share this tab. You can look up a lot about how it works and how the registration works. Begins, user approval, new key created, public key cryptography, the final login process, login challenge, key selected, public key cryptography, the back and forth on there. These, the way FIDO works is a little bit different, and it's actually what makes FIDO so cool. Um, the way it incorporates their authentication in here. So it's, uh, you can read a lot about it. There, there's plenty of documentation on it. There's nothing, it's it's a well-vetted protocol. That is for sure. The hard, hard problem with FIDO is adoption of it, trying to get more places to use it. This is really where the challenge comes in. And I've talked to a lot of security vendors and they're just like, ah, we don't, we would spend the money on embedding it, but you know, we don't think there would be much user adoption. And when you have companies the size of Microsoft and Okta not using it uh, across the board, you're right. You, you, trying to get smaller business to use it is uh, hard. Not, not an easy task at all. So definitely a problem. I'll talk a little bit about the, the YubiKey personalization tool. This is where there's definitely some confusion because you can rewrite the keys and there's reasons you may not want to rewrite the keys. And this is where sometimes people have some confusion about rewriting the keys. So, yes, that's definitely a uh, a problem. <laughs> oh, Travis only trusts people who are drinking whiskey on Monday nights and ranting on YouTube. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> oh, let's see. How does a Sysman Sandor cybersecurity employee combat the onset of imposter syndrome in the company you work for? Um, and, oh, if the company they work for may have been breached, I don't know how to combat easily the imposter syndrome. There's always that, um, in over your head feeling you get quite a bit. Uh, I will tell you, it's a feeling I I've been in a lot of circles and I sometimes like, wow, how, why am I standing next to this person? <laughs> and like, I'm, I feel that way sometimes too. There's not, it's just uh, something you work through when you get over. There's not an easy answer. I think what helps is the fact that we have a word for it, imposter syndrome, because this is not something I knew in the 90s when I started working in tech. Yes, the 90s, um, 20 plus years ago. Uh, we just kind of just felt like, I don't know, you're just figuring it out, but somehow this person next to you knows more than you and there's not really a word. Now that we have a word for it, we understand the shared experience that imposter syndrome is. I think that's helpful because it's not just you. We we don't have a word for it because you are going through it. We have a word for it because all of us, majority of us have some feelings at some levels of imposter syndrome. So it's something you just kind of work through and get over. So, um, Do NFC enable models open a potential weak point? Well, kind of. NFC in general opens a weak point because someone can be within your proximity. And if this is not shielded and they bring something within NFC proximity to you, they may read what's in this. So, for example, someone mentioned you can store inside of a YubiKey your TOTP. 
So if you can store your TOTP within your YubiKey and someone is within NFC range of your YubiKey, then you have a problem. They can pull your TOTP, but you can also set your TOTP to be protected by a password. So they can't just pull it without putting a password. So there are extra mitigations you have, but yeah, that is a um, problem per se. If you have the NFC, it's, it's a proximity problem, so it's not as likely to be an issue, but it is more, it is there. It exists at some level, I should say. I wouldn't, it's not my, you know, do I worry that someone's going to come in proximity to me? Um, I actually keep these, I have an RFID shielded wallet um, that it has a shielding on it, so these won't work through it. That's one of my solutions if I'm transporting these outside of here. I don't worry as much, not to say it couldn't happen, that someone would break in my house and steal them. I mean, it's hopefully uh, they won't. <laughs> you know, not a challenge. Can you get into Tom's house? You can get any house if you're determined enough. I mean, <laughs> so uh, it is a risk, but it is not the highest level of risk. Um, I'm going to wind this down. We've been going... We'll, we'll give it a few more minutes. I'll answer a few more questions. Uh, but I actually, at some point, I do have to go to sleep. I don't, I, maybe I'll pour a little more, but it's about time to wander off and uh, go do whatever it is I do. Well, eventually I do sleep. I usually watch some TV. <laughs> yeah, the shielding is, um, I have this on a lanyard so I don't lose it, but it is not my usual methodology of carrying it. As a matter of fact, this is my demo one. This is not my demo one. Um, this is the one I have things on and I identify it by not having it on something that dingles because if I put it on something that dingles like that, it doesn't fit in my wallet that I close it up in uh, where it can't be scanned. So that's been my simple solution. And there's more of them. I got to, I got to get uh, Chris from Crosstalk Solutions posted stickers and I bought some, one of my employees ordered some of those stickers and skins that go on these. So I got to get some of those so I can identify. These are all my lab ones that I've been playing with. <laughs> uh, do you use the USB-C conversion NFC with your phone? Um, I'm using the NFC with my phone when I do much, but I don't really do anything NFC and the YubiKey with my phone right now. Um, it's not been something I'm using as much. Most of the stuff I log into is... Um, web interface. That's where I've got it all used. I don't, I actually don't have as everything logged in on my phone because I don't need it. It's always a good practice of, um, your principles of least privilege. What do you need things logged into and don't log into them if you don't need them. That's, it's a really, really simple, um, policy, but you know, I'll look at right here. I have, um, a tablet that's password protected. That's a Chrome tablet, but I only have one account and a limited amount of things. I don't log in everything on here. I only need it for a couple of specific use cases. So I minimize what I've even logged into on this tablet to only the things it needs and no more. Um, it's all about keeping restrictions. It's, you know, kind of boring. Matter of fact, I, I, I laughed when the Moxie Marlin spike, if you're not familiar, developer signal, head of security for done a lot of security research. Look up Moxie Marlin spike. Um, really brilliant cryptographer, but he's talked about, someone said, can we follow you around to see what you do all day? And he's like, mm, not really. You'll, you'll be pretty bored. Not that it bothers him, but you know, he still writes a lot of things down. He's very restrictive on how he keeps things. There's just different, you, you'll find people who work in this um, industry. You just start. And I've always thought about this from a long time ago. And this comes up to, it's actually almost an anniversary of 20 years ago was probably the first time I went to a big hacker conference. So that was like 2002. Um, you think differently when you spent that much time hanging out with a bunch of hackers, like I did in the late nineties and early two thousands, you just learn things differently of everything that can go wrong or all the mischievous things you do when you're young. And you're like, wow, I should always think about how to protect myself from those things. Six feet for cybersecurity with NFC. Yeah. Bitwarden and USB-C on phone is what I carry around now. I don't have Bitwarden on my phone. That's actually another thing. Like people have asked about that. I just don't put Bitwarden on my phone. I don't need it on my phone. Um, so, and by the way, my 2FA is on my phone. Therefore, Bitwarden and 2FA on my phone seems like a the combination of things that I don't want on my phone. 
So that's why they're separate from each other. Going back to cybersecurity for one sec, how does one, how does PFSense play that? Don't insurance companies recommend security hardware and software? No, they they want you, to, they don't specify devices. So you can use your, um, you can use your PFSense within there. So that's definitely, um, I, it's not really a factor. We've, you know, we're insured. We use PF Sense. It's not something that's going to really play into the insurance side of it. Buy the format you need based on the devices you use. Yeah, that's a good advice right there. Depending on your level of insurance, you may have to have third-party auditors come in. That that comes down to um, whatever policies you're getting and what your mitigation risks are. There's there's a, there's really interesting to me that there's some new insurance companies. Um, I I don't I don't love this idea, but I think there's a mix. There's there's a happy middle that I don't know where it is yet. But think about this: there are insurance companies. There's a startup insurance company. Um, one of the things that insurance companies are doing, instead of listening and validating, they're getting involved. And what I mean by that is there's insurance companies, and I'm not 100% clear on how they work, but essentially they're talking about having agents that confirm things are going, having log collectors to confirm your 2FA, confirm you're doing something, not trusting you to fill out a form to say you're doing something, and they'll adjust your insurance based on you allowing them to give your logs. Now, this is directly like the equivalent that you have in the car industry where we called it the tattletale device. It is a device insurance companies would plug into your car to see if you did hard braking. They want to know if you're a safe driver. Their limited amount of data versus it's almost intrusive to have this much data being read by the insurance companies, but it's also interesting for them to go through your logs and actually confirm you're doing the things that when you filled out the form for your risk that you're doing. So I, I think we're going to see a lot more about that. Yeah. Our insurance company asked, do you have a hardware firewall? Yes. And that's all they wanted. It's they focus now in the insurance companies are getting smarter about this. The reality is where does the bad stuff happen? It's the endpoints. There's a reason people focus on the endpoints. There's a reason I focus on the endpoints because once you focused on the endpoint, what happens? What Look through differ reports. If you're not familiar with differ reports, these are the debriefs for cybersecurity incidents. And you'll notice all these talks, specifically the one we started this entire live stream with. What are we talking about here? We're talking about everything that happened on the endpoint. The SOC team and the full monitoring and full packet captures are all rewind events of, all right, we see this event on the endpoint. We see it reaching out to the C2 server. How long has it been reaching out to C2 to server is the question we're going to ask the SOC team. The SOC team goes, that IP address started beaconing and this time. Well, cool. By the way, SOC team didn't alert you on this C2 because they didn't know it was a C2. Solar Winds was a uh, the incident that occurred with Solar Winds Orion. Think about how many companies use this, how many companies were asleep at the wheel that all had SOC teams, all of them. They all seen the data flowing being exfiltrated. What did the SOC teams do? They were great. They were ex excellent help once we discovered the SolarWinds Orion hack in rewinding how long they had been in the network, but they didn't alert us to them being in the network. Think about that. And this is played out over and over again. So much of this has to do with you start with the endpoint because that's where the action is. Then it's great to have all that logging and be able to put an IP address into your log server and go, when did this IP address start having interactions with this endpoint? But almost always that investigation, not 100%, but most of the time that investigation is started at the endpoint. It is started by... I see the endpoint doing something unusual based on some behaviors I see, based on the tools we have, based on security research, something with this endpoint. Why is it reaching out to this IP address? And then you'll go through your logs and figure it out. So that is why you spend so much time you focus that. Oh, yes. Once a year, you have to fill out a 20-plus page Q&A for said insurance company. It's a two hours a day, but it's only once a year. You're not wrong, and it is tedious for sure. Yeah, that's uh, 
Definitely true here. I love the idea of explaining to my customers that logs being collected is sent to people. <laughs> I don't even know for insurance folks. Yeah, what could go wrong if an insurance company was now collecting all the logs and has more information? I, man, one of my favorite things, and I'd have to go through, unfortunately, it's kind of, I know where it is, but I'm, I'm too lazy to go through and find this. When we were doing, when me and a couple of my friends that work in security, we're doing how they got hacked, another channel we had started. And for now, it's all on pause. I never say it's over because we always like to revisit things eventually. Anyways, one of our favorite stories we covered that we were just blown away by, and it, the links are buried within there, was a group of hackers that instead of going through and contacting the companies they had hacked, they reached out directly to their insurance companies. So when these companies realized they had been breached or ransomware, they call their insurance company and insurance companies goes, we're already on it. We're already negotiating. And this is how brazen some of the threat actors have gotten is to the point where they were, well, interacting with the insurance companies. Cause that's, you know, why, why waste time? We already know who's going to put the dollars on and who's not. So they would call the insurance companies because yes, yes. Oh, Ray, Excel sheet, name, domain, passwords. Really? I mean, here's the problem. You always, you've heard truth is stranger than fiction. That's because people writing fiction have to stick to narratives that they think you will believe. The truth is, well, reality in general does not have such narrative restrictions as something you think would be really dumb and happening. Therefore, truth is always stranger than fiction in case you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yes. Uh, Excel sheet, name, domain, passwords. Why? Of course it was name, domain, passwords. How else would we find it, Ray? <laughs> I got nothing on that. I mean, convenient. <laughs> That's my favorite part. Hmm. 30 years ago, if you wanted to hack a net uh, network server, you just booted in the DOS. Yes, it did require physical access. And if they had, yeah. Yeah, if you had physical access, I mean, we... We only in more recent years thought a lot more about encryption at rest. Um, encryption at rest is obviously becoming a big topic. It's one of the reasons we take the time to encrypt our VMs. And someone asked me like, well, Tom, if you encrypt your VMs, they're harder to boot because you got to put a password in. I'm like, that's the point. But Tom, that's really inconvenient. And I'm like, it sure is. And <laughs> like, I don't know where to go from here because there's... If you want to make sure not only your backups are encrypted, but if you take the time to encrypt a bootable setup to your VMs, if someone were to somehow break through layers of encryption to grab said backups, the VM itself does not boot without the password. Um, these are just inconveniences, but encrypting data at rest is how you mitigate someone physically taking your servers. It is a very real threat model. Um, you know, I, I think deeply about this being a YouTuber who talks about security. There is absolutely someone painting a target on my back going, that guy, he makes me mad. So they go after you. That's kind of how it works. Uh, there is. Yes. Uh, yep. Yeah, I see. Thank you, Ray. Ray, just, uh, Ray had just sent me that. That's my phone going off. Ah, uh, yes. Just. I know it is. Ah, crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, if you look Ray too, as I retweeted that as well. So thank you. Um, you're not wrong. And for those of you who don't know, me and Ray talked about the Octahack. Uh, he's, uh, there's a video I tweeted just a couple days ago. You can find a link to it. Uh, I've shared it on LinkedIn. Uh, Ray is a personal friend of mine and also a person who's well-versed in tech and security, been in it, I think about as long as I have. Ray's somewhere around my age. <laughs> Uh, please don't open me that XLS with a better, better name. You're not wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, network canaries. They're pretty neat. I don't, I have my own stuff set up. Um, for that, I've talked very little about it on purpose, <laughs> but yes, network canaries thinks canary being the leader in that particular market. Yes. Um, pop with drive encrypt. You know what, Ray? This seeing that tweet is what brought the whiskey out. So we're we're not gonna lie, man. This is uh 
<laughs> this is, I seen that. I'm like, of course they called it domain. And I was just like ranting about it. And I was like, that's how this whole thing started. That's how this silliness began. So uh, have people targeted me? Yes. Yes. I've been trolled and targeted more than once. So that is uh, that is a thing for sure. And thank you for the donation. <laughs> Uh, do you put your RMM on your personal computer? Um, not exactly because of being a Linux desktop, but yes, we use, we, we use our tools. I'll, I, um, we aren't uh, hypocrites in, in that nature. Well, we use Linux and we generally push windows to people because Linux is impractical to use for a lot of our clients, but that's a different topic. That's that has nothing to do with I, I mean, if I could get everybody on Linux because it's support and if it supported their line of business applications, there's certainly some advantages there, but yes. You know, there's a I, I do keep um as well strong separation. I do play some video games, but not on the same um you know, it's not the same computer. You're not like, oh, I'm mixing this. Matter of fact, uh, I have a Bitwarden personal account for my personal computer and I have a Bitwarden business account for my business computer and never shell the two meet. That's an important aspect of keeping things separate. Uh, let's see. Uh, Pop OS, let's go. Absolutely. Big Pop OS fan here. See what else? Uh, simple things like disabling remote access, things like firewalls, so you cannot turn them off. Remotely would go a long way to stopping this. Um, no, the the Octa hack was a lot more than that. People work remotely; that's an accepted thing. Um, the fact that they have password reset methodologies that use phone is pretty much the center around a lot of this. So, yeah, all all good security has definitely some inconveniences here. There is undoubtedly, you know. Thing that uh something we for sure um let's see and i'll even admit right here and i agree with this a lot this is even this is microsoft's remediation talks and we'll bring this up real quick and switch to do 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 this is right from microsoft recommendations Oh, oh, crap. It went to the top. Leverage more secure implementations. FIDO tokens reduce risk and user experience issues associated with passwords. From Microsoft. From the people that got hacked. Going, you know what we should do? We should probably do that FIDO thing. Whoever wrote this was probably a big advocate. And they're just like, just punching away at these keys, smiling, going, told you guys you should be using this. You know, there's there's that person. No one wants them to be right, but they are. So here we are talking about it. So, yes, that's a, um, oh, that is a thing. Well, let's see. Oh, let's see. Can you have the article on Fido? Um, it's just phytoalliance.org. I'll throw it in the chat here. Nothing too special. The other one is just me messaging it from Microsoft, but it's uh, the how Fido works is on phytoalliance.org. You can, it, it's well, the, no good protocol should be secret. The um, security has to be transparent. You have to completely trust it. You have to understand. Well, you don't have to necessarily understand the math, but someone has to understand the math. Someone has to vet the math. And a more transparent security is going to lead to a better security. This is just a absolute given for any of this. It's funny. I think 20 minutes ago, I said I'd go 10 more minutes, but I don't know. Here I am. I guess as long as people are asking me questions or I have something to talk about, I will continue with what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, hopefully that helps with the Fido stuff. So is there any more questions people have before I eventually wind on down? 
Uh, security too up, security is bad. And yes, RDP on 3390 is not any better. Yeah, we just added, instead of 3389, it's on 3390. No one will guess that. No one really looks at the protocol that responds on the port. <laughs> Oh, there we go. People who think closed source is more secure because you can't see the insecure code. Ah, yes. If if only that was really true, <laughs> then Microsoft wouldn't be in the predicament they are in with all of their security vulnerabilities. I mean, most uh, so much of their security stuff is just a mess. You know, I can rant to I, I um duo authentication. That we that I was having a really good conversation with a client. But also duo authentication. The fact that they default to fail open. Um, there was that write up on the, I don't remember the name of the NGO, but one of the NGOs, um, non government organizations that was hacked, was using duo. How do they bypass duo? How do they get by their security? Well, two things. This is really interesting write up. So the two things they did to bypass duo was one, a account had become unregistered from duo. So they had a old credential that was not registered to Duo. That got them access because upon access, it asked them to register to Duo. Oh, no problem. They just registered to Duo. So now they have Duo access. But the next thing you need to do is privilege escalate to a more high-level account. How do you do that? Well, those high-level accounts have Duo. How do you bypass it? Well, if you followed the Duo next, yes, next, yes, install instructions, you installed Duo with its default parameter of fail open. Well, the reason it fails open is if it cannot contact the server, it fails open. Now, the problem with that is, you know, Duo does a really good job of servers. I don't even know if I've ever found Duo to be down. Duo has an uptime that's amazing because they have redundant servers. So if one Duo server isn't up, one of the other duo servers is up. So fail open doesn't seem that bad unless, unless you go into the settings of said server and you re um, you create a host entry for duo. So it fails close fails because it can't resolve it. So they added a host entry for duo, allowing it to fail. Therefore fail open. And now all I needed was the credential to get in. And uh, that was just one of those things like, uh, don't set it to fail open. So just, just, just don't, just don't. So, um, GRC squirrel is a great idea. Adoption is the hard idea. So I think it's great. I think it's cool, but yeah, it's just, yeah. Um, I don't think anyone will adopt it. It's always doing an S. Yeah, it's always DNS. Mm -hmm. Semi off topic, getting a dash cam for my truck because I went down the YouTube rabbit hole, uh, Cam's personal security. Um, I, I've thought about getting one for my truck because I like the fact that I have it built into my Tesla. It's great because my Tesla records everything. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I, I've gone down the rabbit hole too. I don't know what the best one is. They're not a bad idea, though. Hey, thanks for uh, sharing information. I learned a lot watching the videos and greatly enjoy them. Awesome. Glad you were here doing that. So, yeah. Fail open is a failed idea. Yes. It's always DNS, especially when you set it to be DNS. <laughs> Oh, uh, notepad and host attacks are classic. That's all you need. A little notepad, a little host entry, a little fail open. Which companies would have a uh, mindset of PFSense where it installs most secure settings by default? Um, Yeah. I have no validation of this, but someone did say that the VFO cams are great. Um, You know, I... I uh, I don't really know enough about the cameras to really have a, a deep comment on that. So coding while watching your favorite firewall teacher. Awesome. I, I assume you mean me <laughs> going on a limb here. I'm guessing. 
Any more questions before Tom wanders off? And wanders off means I turn my chair exactly this many degrees. That's how I that's how I wander off. I'll I'll reply to some messages, send a few emails, and then I'll go to bed. That's um, and then I'll, and and I, after a couple hours, you'll find me back over here again. <laughs> Didn't know Kessis had Tamas on the sides of cars until I started watching some videos. Hey, speaking of watching some videos, who wants to watch a video of Tom's car get hit? <laughs> this is fun. Let me switch. Um, I, I haven't posted this. I, this has all been resolved. But my car did get hit. So that's the thing. Um, it's in my library, right? Or is it in my videos? I don't even know. Yeah. So let me uh, share this tab. I don't know how this will play. Let's. I, we can find out. This is uh, Tom's car getting hit last year. So they drive by, and then they come up and uh, they turn around. And, and this is while my car is parked. I actually, I'm in the restaurant and thunk, whack, hit my car. And this is the part you're going to laugh the most about. For, so they hit my car. And then he doesn't think he hit my car. She's very aware he hit my car. Watch the reaction she has when she gets out of the car. He jumped to that part. He, you can see that she is unhappy. He doesn't look, he looks clueless. She's like, you hit a Tesla. <laughs> She's looking at the car. He's like, what? Now, where this gets even funnier is, and this is not in the camera part here. I didn't record this. That's a dog in the, in the car. They don't leave the dog in the car. The dog is fine. Uh, they come in the bar and that I'm at and, then I see their dog and I'm like, oh, you have a really cute dog. So I actually passed and interacted with them uh, briefly. So there's that. And and then when I got outside, it was raining a lot. And uh, I didn't know someone had bumped into my car. So, yeah, that's uh, that's that incident. So, yes, they do have cameras. Ah. <laughs> uh... Yeah, it sucked, but the other side of it was um, the only thing they did was they hit my wheel and they took off my wrap. So all they did was damage the wrap. So I just had to get the wrap redone and it was no damage to the body underneath. So it, it took them. Um, my uh, friend owns the company that did my wrap. And well, they're my client too. Uh, I took the car in the morning, like, I don't know, eight in the morning and I picked it up at noon. That's how quick they've refixed my wrap. So uh, four hour repair time to get my wrap redone. They rubbed it with the wheel and it just peeled all the wrap off the car. <laughs> um, their insurance paid. Uh, their insurance paid. So that's it. Matter of fact, the funny part is because I didn't have a deductible on this because they hit me. Um, and that's a wrap. Yes. How do you not feel the bump of another car? I Well, she obviously was aware of it. I wasn't in the car. My car was parked at the time. I was in the bar with my friends. So is wrapping worth it? Been considering it. I am just going to say yes. I mean, I think wrapping's worth it. One, I have had to fix my wrap twice in two year, three years now of having my car wrapped. I've had to fix it. But, I mean, to me, let me find a good picture of it. I love the way it looks. So the, um, we're way off topic now, right? Because we're looking at Tom's car. <laughs> I love the way my wrap looks. I think it's worth it. You can't tell. This is after that was hit. Um, you can't tell that it was hit. You can't see the damage anymore because when they peel a wrap off, they could just replace a section at a time. So you can't tell that there are two sections of wrap here that have been replaced. It's um, 
it, it's one of those things you may not notice on the car when they replace any section, but the nose um, was actually redone and you, there's no difference in it when you look at it. So I think the wraps are really cool. If you care about preserving the paint it really comes down to one, I wanted my car to look different. That was the number one reason I wrapped it. The bonus is the fact that my car has a cool wrap on it. Um, then as it's gotten scratched up, I've just redone sections of the wrap. Like the, I've had to redo the nose because it got so beat up over um, a bunch of rocks and shit hit it. So when a bunch of rocks and knocked my wrap with little pits in it, I just replaced the front nose of the wrap. Didn't cost me much at all. So there's some, um, that's to me is a big advantage of it, especially Michigan. You know, we have winters in salt. You're, you're not in Michigan. You don't have that problem. It still looks cool though. I will admit too. Matte black looks pretty cool. There's a lot of cool colors you can do with it, too. Um, let me find another look. It also, um, it's probably a bit deceiving, but we'll, let's go ahead and, uh, that's what the car looks when you're actually moving around it. So it's not just one color. It's a shifting of colors as you walk around my car. get you an idea. So yeah, I think it looks pretty cool. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, he drove over there. He drove over there too. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Florida has sun and salt. Ocean is great. Yeah, I never park. I never park in the garage. So, mm, yeah. RGB Tesla. I just, I, I just got here. That's Tom's car. Yes, that is Tom's car. <laughs> uh, top conferences I'd recommend going to. That's not easy. Um, I guess it, it, you have to start with what are you, what are you trying to gain before we can answer the question of what conference you should go to. I mean, myself, I like Linux conferences and hacker conferences. Those are interesting to me. If you're more into business growth than channel partner conferences and in IT Nation and other IT related conferences may be better for you. So the conference you go to is a, a direct answer to what your goal is when you're doing it. So. Uh, if you're interested in doing this here, Mach-E, it is a. Uh, the color is called 3M Flip Psychedelic. <laughs> Surprise, that's legal. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. DEF CON. Now, if you're into hacking, DEF CON, Black Hat. Um, you know, we're on the topic of security, so we can even talk about... Um, There is the, uh, this is coming up this year, is a Hope Conference, the Hackers on Planet Earth. I mean, if you're talking cybersecurity, yeah, there's cybersecurity conferences that are out there. IT manager will enjoy IT-related conferences. Yeah, there's, I mean, I don't go to as many as I probably should, so... Talks about conferences, grabs another drink. So um, in this is one you'd be interested in probably, Veronica, because Ohio Linux Fest is pretty big. Um, it's been a couple of years since I've been, uh, but I, I truly enjoyed the Ohio Linux Fest. I like, I, I've been to, um, specifically I, in 2020, I went to, uh, I was at DEF CON, the, uh, more, let's get real specific. I was at the DEF CON um, safe mode, the car hacking village which was a lot of fun. So if we, uh, when was I there? Somewhere, there's a picture of Tom at one of these things, because that's what Tom does. Oh yeah, there we go. So 
There's Tom at the, uh, yes, we were hacking Teslas because that's a thing. Me and me and some of the friends, this is at the uh, DEF CON Car Hacking Village. We actually did a live stream right from the DEF CON Hacking Village. These are some uh, infamous car hackers that I'm hanging out with. So definitely, definitely a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, yes, the roads are rough. The roads are rough. That's for sure. You missed a few minutes on Tom's car. Yes, there's um, that's definitely. Can we keep sharing photos of here? There's. We want to scroll through Tom's photos all the time. Uh, oh yeah, hey, here we we can. This one's definitely worth sharing, because it's Tom's car again with the DefCon flag hanging out in front of the car hacking place we we're at. So. Matter of fact, I think for a while, this if you follow me on Facebook, this is still, I think, the top picture on my Facebook or something. I don't know. I just thought it was cool because um, I, I got the DEF CON flag there, and I like the DEF CON logo for that year. So, Yeah, if you... um. I, I tell you, the, the hacking conferences are definitely awesome that you'll meet the coolest people there all the time. Uh, I think that's where I learn the most is those. It's just, I don't know. It's just an environment where you really get to uh, engage with people at a different level. So um, I'm a big fan of any of the hacker conferences. So the uh, Ohio Linux Fest is probably the uh, the big local one if you're into Linux. But this is something I learned today is, did you know, and uh, Linux uh, Foundation, not this one, hold on, Linux Foundation event Detroit. I am excited about this. This is actually pretty cool. Uh, why can I find the Linux Foundation link? There we go. There's all those stupid links. I want the Linux Foundation link. This is um, coming to Detroit. This is uh, by the Linux Foundation. And uh, this is pretty cool. It's in Detroit. We have an event, a tech event in Detroit. I'm excited. I I just, we, I haven't seen a tech event in Detroit in so long. I always have to travel if I want to go somewhere. But right here is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And I'm, I don't care. It's in Detroit, so I'm going. Even though I'm not a Kubernetes user, I'm going to have fun there because I'm going to go meet with some of the people I know. Uh, my friend um, and a few of them work for the Linux Foundation, so I'm excited about that too. So, uh, yes, we actually have a, an event coming on here. So now GERCON is another thing that does happen here in roughly, it's in Michigan at least. That's not our hacking event. Funny enough, from Michigan from the Grand Rapids area, I've been, uh, all the things open source, love to get involved with blue, red Linux conferences around the area. I, I think we need to, and maybe I'm bad. I'm not an organizer of people. I don't think that's a skill I have to organize an event, but my desire for an event means I would, I would back someone and promote someone who's willing to organize a Linux event around here. So I will be at um, uh, Penguin Con. Uh, you will find me at this conference. I might even be speaking there because I've spoke there a few times. Um, so Penguin Con 2022 is on. And so I will be at this to to call this your usual to your usual conference would be very unusual. Um, it's not. It is a mishmash of things. Um, that's the best way I can describe the way PingoCon works. They've had a amazing array of special guests. My friend Nuri, um, Nuri's awesome. I'm happy to see him back there. The, but it's kind of a sci-fi conference combined with Linux people, combined with writers and literature and cosplayers and everything. Uh, it's a weird, weird nerd event. So not exactly uh, something 
um, that I would say is for everyone, unless you're really into geek culture. And I'm oddly less into all the geek culture, but I love the Linux and the people there. Jay from Learn Linux TV, that's how I know him. Many of my friends, including the ones that work at the Linux Foundation, that's how I met them. My friend who works and does some very interesting cybersecurity work. I've met them, them, all of those people I met at Penguin Con, uh, and it's local. Um, if you're a Penguin Con, you also get to see Wendell from Level 1 Techs. All right, I'll let you guys a little secret. Me and Wendell already messaged. I'll be hanging out with Wendell from Level 1 Techs. That was that was the deciding factor because I wasn't sure if I was going to Penguin Con, and right away I messaged Wendell, hey, Wendell, you going to go to Penguin Con this year? As soon as he said yes, I was like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> Count me in because, you know, Wendell. Wendell's awesome. You see, uh, I, I've, um, last time I seen Wendell at Penguin Con was probably about, ah, uh, three years ago, four years ago. It's been, it's been a minute because, uh, Penguin Con, because of the pandemic has been a minute. You know, we started this as a cybersecurity topic and we're 30 minutes off of that. So. Love watching CTF breakdowns. Great learning material on how systems are compromised. Yes, my friend John Hammond, uh, who works for Huntress, and we use Huntress as one of our cybersecurity tools, is absolutely does a great job on all of that. So, super cool. I'm not even sure which you're super cooling to because <laughs> we covered a lot of topics. <laughs> I'm assuming some of the Linux stuff on there and the uh, Penguin Gun stuff. But yeah, I have. Uh, Penguin Con is definitely an interesting. I've sponsored the event a couple times. My well, I should say I, but my company has my, but I own the company, so yes, I sponsored it. Um, I used to help them with a few things. I'm my goal this year is to get back involved with Penguin Con, um, because I thought their tech track was less than it should have been. Therefore, I never. Here's a simple rule I have. I don't complain about things I don't have intention to change. So I don't complain that I don't think there's enough tech things at PenguinCon unless I'm going to try to take an active role in making more tech things at PenguinCon. So my goal this year, we submitted, me and Jay submitted um, three talks to do. We don't know if our submissions have been accepted, but if they are accepted, awesome. And um, I want to meet the new people involved because I know some of the other, there's been some changing of people and get involved again in pushing the uh, pink, pushing penguin con to the tech areas that I think it should be. I don't want to detract at all from the other areas people enjoy, such as literature, but I would like to see some good dives into and, Penguin Con's always been a big advocate, and so are the people there for open source. I don't mind giving more talks, and as I have in the past, on a lot of open source things and topics. So, yeah, that's kind of my goal for Penguin Con. All right. Now we're an hour and 32 minutes in. I think it's time for me to wander off and uh, fall asleep for at least three or four hours. I will stop doing this. We're tightening the cap, not loosening it, in case anyone's wondering. Just make sure it's on tight. I do not leave this down here. This this goes into my cabinet with my things. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Is Xavier joining you at any of these conferences? Not that, well, I'm waiting to hear back from Xavier if he wants to go to Hope. Um, if I have a few people I know that plan to go to Hope, the hackers on planet Earth, I'll go. I haven't decided if I'm going. I'm waiting to see if it's someone I know because I have not been to the Hope conferences before. So if someone's going and that I know at least one person, um, so I'm not a feeling completely a stranger, as much as I seem like a social person, I don't do well in social situations. They're not places of comfort for me. Um, I usually have to know someone. So uh, so that's definitely a, uh, if someone's going, I may go with Xavier. I don't know which ones Xavier's going to. Xavier goes to DEF CON. That's much I can tell you. So you can, if you're wondering where you can find Xavier, he'll be among the thousands of people attending DEF CON. Uh, are we at Sky Talk? <laughs> Lots of fun. All right. Now that I've wandered and killed off the audience, I'm watching the numbers go down. Thank you for everyone who took the time to join in. Thank you for listening to me rant about security. It was definitely a lot of fun in the beginning. Um, if you made it this far, watching it in post, awesome. You've really listened to me rant quite a bit. So, oh, something gave me a little bit of a hiccup there. But uh, it is time for me to fall asleep, I guess. I uh, 
eventually there's there's a time where my energy levels will probably wander down and I, I gotta start this over again in the morning because I have more things to do. Anyways, as always, thank you everyone and see you later.